So hi uh, everyone. Uh, today we have Fabiola Gerosa uh, to give a, a talk on protoplanetary uh, disks. Uh, she's doing a PhD at the Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur. Uh, Fabiola, go ahead. So hi everyone. Thanks Raphael for having me today. It's a pleasure to give this talk. And um, as Raphael said, I'm a PhD student. I'm doing my second year at the Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur. I'm working with Eloise Meu and with Jeremy Beck. And we are working on this project that is at the edge between uh, astrophysics and uh, uh, fluid dynamics. Um, and the um, objective is to one, better understand the turbulence in protoplanetary disks. So today I'm going to show you some results from my first year on uh, gas and dust dynamics in uh, turbulent protoplanetary disks. Um, so to start, um, what is a protoplanetary disk? So this object is um, it's a system in rotation around young stars. For young stars, we mean um, stars that are still not in their um, main sequence. So uh, typically, uh, one million younger than one million year, and we actually see disks around uh, around eighty percent of uh, these young stars. In particular, uh, around almost all the um, the small young stars. So we understand that uh, these disks have a fundamental role in um, in the last uh, phases of uh, star formation. Um, but also, disks are not only formed of gas. Uh, they also have a small component of dust that is around one percent in uh, mass. But of course, this component is very important because is the component that is going to form uh, is going to be used to form uh, planets. So um, the the existence of protoplanetary disks has been uh, actually postulated way back in time, like in the 18th century. Uh, but then, of course, we we had to wait until uh, uh, the last uh, pe uh, last years of uh, the of last century to be able to directly observe uh, protoplanetary disks. Uh, but lately, our knowledge, uh, thanks to this observation, has uh, has increased a lot. In particular, in the last years, there have been uh, even surveys of protoplanetary disks. So now we can have. Uh, quite, uh, we can actually have statistics about disks, like their masses, sizes, edges, and so ages, and so on. So we have uh, an enormous quantity of uh, information coming from these observations. Um, disks can uh, can emit from uh, micron up to several millimeters. So it's uh, very important to study them in various wavelengths, and uh, we can also use different uh, observation tracers. So here I'm showing, for example, scattered light, that it's um, the emission due to the smaller dust particles in the disks that are on the surface of the disk. Uh, we can then observe uh, with thermal continuum, that is the emission from uh, larger dust particles. And thanks to this uh, continuum, we can uh, study, understand the, the more internal, more dense uh, zones uh, of the disk. And then, of course, we have the emission, the spectral line emission from, uh, from gas. Um, indeed, we cannot, uh, we cannot study H2, that is the most uh, present molecule in the disk, but we can still study other molecules. Uh, the most used is for sure the CO. Uh, and uh, as you see from these images, these are all the same disks. Disc. So, of course, uh, um, but they look very different. So we we understand how important it is to have uh, these different observations done done in various wavelengths with different tracers, and of course with different um, um, done with different instruments uh, to have uh, a comprehensive. Uh, understanding of disks, uh, in particular of the distribution of dust uh, and gas uh, in disks, but also many other uh, properties. Uh, talking about um, um, uh, instruments, I just want to cite ALMA because since 2013, thanks to ALMA, we uh, completely, like ALMA completely revolutioned our uh, knowledge about disks, uh, thanks to its very high resolution. This is the maximum resolution that ALMA can reach. Uh, and thanks to this, we are able to actually resolve, uh, finally resolve the disk, even the, the 
inner parts of the disk when where we know most of uh, planet formation is uh, most of the planet formation phases are happening and i'm just giving you an example this is uh, hl tau the, the first image of hl tau from 2015 uh, in which we can even see substructures like uh, rings and gaps uh, this image of course is uh, very <laughs> impressive and um, it really shows the the power of uh, of alma um, but then together with uh, with observation we also have the theoretical part of uh, about protoplanetary disk so first of course these two parts are very entangled indeed with theory we try to understand and to describe what we see from observation so of course thanks to this uh, uh, very uh, in this incredible amount of observations uh, that has been performed in the last years, we also have changed uh, a bit our the, the, the theoretical uh, knowledge that we have about disks. Um, but here I'm just showing some very simple equations that uh, help us to describe uh, the structure of the disk. So vertically, we have these, uh, the dependence, the vertical dependence of uh, density. We see that density is decreasing with um, with uh, vertically, as we could expect, the denser part is the mid plane. And we also see a dependence on H, that is the um, disk um, um, eight, uh, scale eight. And uh, this also changes with radius. It depends on this beta parameter that is assumed to be, assumed to be um, believed to be smaller than one half. And this means that the disk is actually flaring uh, outside, so in the exterior part. Uh, of the disk and this has been also observed for example uh, on uh, on the disk uh, around hh30 that we can clearly see is uh, is flaring uh, outside then radially we can also give uh, an equation for the um, dependence on the radius of the surface density again this is uh, decreasing uh, with uh, radius so the, the the denser part of the disk is going to be the inner mid plane of the disk and also for the temperature. Of course, as I said, these are very simplified equations. We can give a much more complex equation also to better describe observation. For example, you can uh, um, give a tapered profile for the surface density and different authors also use different uh, uh, exponents for, for these uh, radial dependence. But in general, uh, um, even if simple, these equations are very important to, to have a general idea of uh, how um, a disk is structured. Uh, but what we can't, of course, uh, forget is that disks are, are very um, active systems. So we cannot neglect the dependence on, on time. Uh, in particular, uh, we know that disks, that the material from the disk has to accrete into the central star for, for, the, for, for the star to, to complete its, uh, its formation. And we also know this, uh, we also can see the this accretion from, uh, from observations. Here you can see a bit uh, this jet from HH30. Indeed, in many disks, uh, we can spot jets or molecular outflows that are related to the accretion uh, toward the central star. But also we can see it from the spectral energy distribution of the star. For example, in this example, in this, um, in this uh, set, um, you can see here, this part that is due to the to the magnetospherical accretion. Um, here I'm reporting this the, the the formula for the um, angular momentum uh, of the disk, and uh, we can simply compute it, and we can we can see this uh, dependence on radius. So for accretion to happen, we need to remove uh, angular momentum from the disks from the disk. Uh, there are two main ways to do this. There is the viscous evolution and the disk swings. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to mostly talk about viscous evolution, but I'm also going to give uh, some information about disk uh, winds. So what is viscous evolution? Uh, we, viscous evolution means that we believe um, the um, angular momentum can be transported, can be removed, thanks to the friction to do viscosity in the disks. But which viscosity? The one could firstly uh, believe it is uh, the molecular viscosity. But if we put uh, values, typical values for this, we see that uh, the time scale of uh, viscous evolution due to molecular viscosity 
is very, very large. Uh, it's too large because we know that uh, this has to evolve uh, in, uh, in millions of years, for sure not 10 to the 13 years. So then uh, Shakura and Sanya have um, postulated that uh, this viscosity could, could actually be a turbulent viscosity, so due to the turbulence in the disk. And they parameterize this viscosity to an alpha parameter called the Shakura Sanya parameter. Uh, and if we um, try to understand the value of this alpha from a typical time scale of evolution of disk, um, of a protoplanetary disk, we need this alpha to be 10 to the minus two. But from lately, from observation, um, we that have been done with different methods, but still all of them to, to compute this alpha, but still all of them, they or at least most of them, they agree that this alpha parameter probably has to be smaller, like 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. I will come back to this, uh, this agreement uh, later, but uh, in general, uh, this is uh, what is believed that the rubric viscosity is believed to be the viscosity that is driving the viscous evolution. But uh, again, there is a problem. The problem is that um, we need uh, to have turbulent viscosity to, uh, to have turbulence in the disks. Disk. But if we look at the Riley criteria for the stability of uh, the hydrodynamical flow, uh, we see that um, e this, uh, this criteria is always satisfied in disk. So it means that we can never be unstable to, um, uh, we can never be unstable, so we can never produce uh, um, turbulence in this uh, in hydrodynamical flow of the disk. So how can you produce turbulence in the disk? Uh, the main uh, answer that has been given many years ago is that uh, actually, if you add some um, magnetic field to the disk, uh, the criterion at this point for, for the magneto, uh, magneto hydrodynamical flows uh, it changes, and this time it becomes uh, satisfied in the disk. It, it, it's going to be satisfied in the disk, so we can actually have uh, uh, magneto rotational instability in protoplanetary disks. And this can create, of course, uh, turbulence. Uh, but again, there is a problem. The problem is that um, some zones of the disk cannot be ionized because, uh, in particular, the central part of the disk, they, um, for medium radius and in the mid plane, this part is too cold to be thermally ionized and too dense to be ionized from X rays or V rays from the from the star or from um, interstellar. Um, interstellar uh, cosmic rays. Uh, again, uh, and, and because of this, so we have these uh, dead zones and where non-ideal uh, processes can, can happen and this dumps a lot uh, MRI, uh, magnetic rotation instability in the disk. So we cannot have uh, strong turbulence in this zone. Again, there, is, uh, there are solutions. The solution could have, have could be have other type of instability. So for example, self-gravity, if the disk is massive enough, vertical shear instability, convective overstability, zombie vortex instability, and many other second order instabilities. But also two phase instability that it's, um, the instabilities can happen um, because of the um, inter, um, of the mutual, uh, um, mutual relationship between uh, gas and dust. So it's caused by, by these two phases of gas and dust. And I will come back on, uh, on these uh, instabilities uh, later. Um, but again, the other, as I said, the other possible solution is, um, is disk winds. These winds have, have actually uh, uh, gained a renewed interest in the last years. Uh, because of this uh, discover that uh, these uh, are not completely ionized. And uh, they are very interesting because they both can drive accretion uh, without need for high level of turbulence. So they can help to re-give agreement between what, uh, uh, to, to explain why in, from observations, we see levels of alpha parameters that are quite low. Uh, but they can also cause ulterior mass uh, loss directly through ejection. So they can both drive accretion and ejection. Um, actually, 
what is probably happening in disk is not just one like viscous evolution or disk winds, but probably all these uh, physical processes are cooperating uh, to control the evolution of disks. As you can see, for example, from this uh, very nice um, team, um, probably in different type, different zones of the disk, we will have um, one uh, that one uh, case is more one process is more strong than another. But in general, probably they're all cooperating uh, together. Um, so yeah, uh, I get from this uh, this introduction, I guess you can understand how complex. Uh, the physics of protoplanetary disks is, and uh, in particular, uh, despite the very uh, the, the amazing quantity of uh, of uh, observations, you can understand that we still don't have a very clear um, uh, knowledge on the level of turbulence, but also in particular on the origin of turbulence. And uh, but understanding turbulent disks, turbulence in disks, is not only fundamental for the viscous evolution. But it also is fundamental because it 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 um, um, it has a very strong um, uh, importance for the dynamics of dust. So let's start to talk a bit more about the dust component. That as I saw, as I said, it's a very small component but very important. Uh, dust uh, in disks start from a size of micrometer, uh, sub micrometer even and has to increase to form uh, planets. Uh, it has to accrete and form planets. Uh, planets like, for example, the one that we saw in the solar system. But in the last years, we've seen uh, many, many planets also discovered around the other stars. So we understand that is fundamental. Um, this process of, of uh, formation of planets is very important. It has to be uh, very efficient. Uh, dust in particular has to increase to uh, over 12 orders of magnitude, so it's a quite a, uh, quite large uh, growth. Today I'm going to focus on uh, this part, so dust from uh, micrometer size uh, that goes to form planetesimals that are kilometer-sized objects that are um, what we see, for example, in the solar system as asteroids or comets. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on this part because it's still one of the most uh, not under, understood parts of uh, the, the planet formation theory. Uh, in how planetesimal can form is still an open question. And this is because um, uh, particles can seem to grow only up to centimeter decimeter in size. Uh, when you just uh, account for their sticking after collisions. Uh, and, but then particles seem to not be able to grow uh, to larger sizes. And this is due to two main uh, barriers, the fragmentation barrier and the drift barrier. The fragmentation barrier has been discovered both uh, from theory, but also from uh, experiments. And uh, they show that uh, particles when they collide, they can stick together. They arrive to centimeter decimeter in size. Uh, but then ulterior collisions can only um, uh, lead to bouncing or in the worst case scenario to uh, fragmentation of, uh, of the particles because uh, their velocity are gonna be, the velocity of collision is gonna be too strong. While the drift barrier is uh, due to the fact that dust in disks uh, as a Keplerian, Keplerian rotation, but uh, gas as a sub-Keplerian velocity of rotation uh, because it's sustained also by, by pressure. And this means that the dust will feel a headwind of, uh, because of the gas and the dust will spiral toward uh, the central star. And uh, the velocity of uh, this uh, accretion toward the central star uh, depends on the size of the, of the dust. And uh, again, it's peaking at uh, dimension of centimeter decimeter. Uh, so again, these particles will spiral uh, very fast toward the central star. And in a very small amount of time, all these particles will be accreted to the star and there will be no dust left in the disk to form ulterior, um, to, to continue the, um, the, the growth toward the planetesimals and planets. So what is believed to be the solution is to form uh, dust clumps that can very rapidly and efficiently 
um, form planetesimals directly. So, so going directly from dust to planetesimals. Uh, the most known and used uh, solution is the streaming instability, in which uh, that is due to the back reaction from dust onto the, the gas, uh, thanks to which some filaments can form in the disk, and then these filaments collapse to form planetesimals. Again, there are some problems in this. In particular, uh, you probably, you, you, for this back reaction to be effective, you need uh, parts of the disk in which um, the mass ratio between uh, gas and dust can go from 99 to 1 to 1 to 1. So you need zones of the disk in which dust is very concentrated. Uh, also, they have discovered lately that probably you also need to have particles quite large already from the beginning, so not micrometer. And uh, also they noticed that in these simulations, they always use uh, a laminar flow uh, for the gas. But if you um, instead use a flow that is a gas flow that is already turbulent, uh, the streaming instability can be quite uh, inhibited. So in this context, we want to understand what is the role of turbulence for planetesimal formation. So, if it's a diffusing mechanism, like it is uh, assumed to be in, for example, in these uh, simulations of streaming stability, or if it, can, if it can have a role, a different role, so the opposite role, not uh, worsening the, the problem of planetary information, but actually helping planetary information through the concentration of particles. To do this, we perform 2D direct numerical simulations. We use a shearing box approach in which we have a um, box that is uh, small enough uh, to neglect um, uh, to neglect uh, curvature that is rotating with Keplerian rotation, so it's uh, sheared rotation. So uh, we are the, the the rotation is faster the closer we are to the star, and we study in particular two um, parameters. The we we systematically study the parameter space of these two parameters, the rotation frequency omega, that, as I said, depends on the distance from the star, and the solid response time, response time that instead depend on the, on the size of the dust particle. Uh, and then we analyze the results with a quite innovative, um, in a quite innovative way, with tools borrowed from the study of dynamical system. These tools have been known for quite some years from the, um, fluid dynamics uh, community, but are quite new for the astrophysical community. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show you my results. And we can start with the results on the on the turbulent gas. So we are solving the incompressible gamma stroke equation that are expressed as uh, expressed um, in function of vorticity that is um, and the rotor of the, the curl of the turbulent uh, velocity fluctuations. And uh, you can see here uh, that we add this, uh, this forcing to maintain turbulence. Uh, this forcing has a quite uh, general shape. It's a Gaussian that is uh, has a zero mean. Uh, it's uh, white in time. It's homogeneous, isotropic, so qu a quite general form of uh, forcing. And we keep it fixed in all our simulations. And I believe this is very important, quite innovative in our study. Because by doing this, keeping the forcing uh, fixed and varying the rotation rate, we are varying the, the ratio between the strength of turbulence and the, and the importance of rotation. Uh, in this way, we are not focusing on one specific type of instability as it's done in most uh, studies, but we are instead trying to be as general as possible. So we are trying to um, uh, to study different uh, zones of the disk uh, in which um, different instabilities can happen. For example, in the case of very low rotation, we're going to have a ratio uh, between forcing and rotation between turbulence and rotation uh, quite high. And so it means the, the, the turbulence will be the first um, first order effect. And this is what, example is seen if, what for example, is seen for MRIs. Um, but when instead we increase the, uh, the rotation rate, 
we are decreasing this ratio and we are studying so second order instabilities in which indeed the rotation is the first order effect and the turbulence is, uh, is uh, less strong with respect to, to rotation. So in this way, we are uh, actually trying to be general, general as possible and to study different, uh, different zones of the disks in which different uh, instabilities can happen. Um, so here I'm showing you two movies uh, in, um, for two different rotation rates. Uh, this uh, sigma is just the dimensionalized, uh, dimensionalized rotation rate. Um, so one for low rotation and one for fast rotation. In blue, you can see the anticyclones that are the eddies rotating with the opposite uh, direction respect to the disk rotation. And you read the, the cyclones that are rotating in the same sense of the disk. And you can see uh, two main effects. So for sure, for fast rotation, the vortices get stretched. Uh, their aspect ratio um, becomes much, much larger. But also, we notice that shear uh, tends to destroy the cyclones uh, while favoring the survivals of only anticyclones. And we, we see how important this is for uh, clustering of dust particles. You can see this also from the PDF of vorticity in which clearly the PDF becomes more and more asymmetrical with the, um, with faster, for faster rotation, with negative tails that become much, much larger respect to the positive uh, tails. Uh, but here, I would like you to notice this, uh, this part, the, the skewness and the stress kurtosis. Um, in particular, these last three points that seem to change uh, the tendency from increasing to decreasing or opposite from decreasing to increasing. Um, this is now just uh, a problem of these last three points. But when we started to perform our simulation, it was actually starting much, much uh, before uh, in a graph for much lower rotation. Uh, in, indeed, we believe that this is a, a geometrical problem. Uh, it is related to the fact that our um, um, shearing box initially was a squared shearing box. But this is uh, a problem because the two uh, dimensions that we have, the X dimension, so the radial um, direction and the uh, azimuthal direction, they have a very different time scale of dynamics. Uh, the dynamics on the X is very uh, slow, while the dynamics on the uh, Y, especially for fast rotation, is very, very fast. So we needed a larger aspect ratio to take into account these two um, time scales. Uh, we, now we have a four to one aspect ratio. So of course we are able to go to much larger uh, rotation. Still probably uh, we, we would need uh, to go to even fast, even larger aspect ratio for, for the larger, for the cases of most, uh, more rapid rotation. Uh, we still believe that this is enough to understand the tendency of uh, of a, a, a symmetry bit of the PDF. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to show you this is that uh, also something I'm seeing now with uh, the new simulations I'm performing is that uh, you need to take some time to to perform trials and to understand the the your results. Uh, if the results that you see are due to spurious effects or to real physical effects and try to reduce as much as possible the spurious uh, effects. So then we can move to the um, dynamics of particles in this uh, turbulent, uh, uh, turbulent flow. Uh, so for, uh, for the particles, we are using uh, Lagrangian approach respect to the Eulerian approach that we use for the flow. Um, here we have uh, the equation for the particle dynamics. Uh, this is the drag force, this is the Coriolis force, and this is the gravitational and centrifugal forces. Uh, here I'm showing again three movies for different values of rotation and different uh, values of uh, Stokes uh, number. Uh, and um, and we the Stokes number is, is just the uh, dimensionalized uh, stopping time. And we notice three behaviors. We notice that there is a, some cases in which the particles are fill, filling the space, cases in which the particles are uh, clustering on these lines, uh, and this is called fractal clustering, and cases in which the particles will cluster to, uh, to points. Um, this is due 
the, the difference between, uh, and, and these points are actually um, localized inside, as you can notice, inside anticyclones. This is due uh, to the Coriolis force. Indeed, the Coriolis force in the case of cyclones, it's always positive. While in the case of anticyclones, it becomes negative and it can actually um, uh, counteract the centrifugal force. And for fast rotation, it can um, even uh, overcome the centrifugal force, um, helping particles to focus inside the anticyclone instead of being ejected from it. So um, we want to have a more quantitative view on uh, concentration of dust. To do this, we uh, compute the Lyapunov dimension. This dimension is uh, a quantity that gives uh, an estimation of the um, uh, dimension of the attractor in the phase space. So to be more clear, uh, if this Lyapunov dimension is equal to zero, uh, the attractor will be a point. So all the particles will cluster to a point. If these uh, dimensions between one and two, the attractor in the phase space will be a line. So the particles will uh, cluster fractally on lines. And if it's larger than two, it means that the particles are filling uh, the whole uh, space. Here I'm showing uh, uh, the value of the Lyapunov dimension uh, as a function of uh, the shear rate and the Stokes number that, as I said, is, that, uh, is the a dimensionalized uh, stop in time. Each point, uh, black point here is a different simulation that we performed. And uh, you can uh, clearly see that we have uh, the three cases that I highlighted before. Um, in particular, uh, you can see that for most of our phase uh, space, uh, of our space uh, parameter space, we have the particles cluster. They can cluster more strongly in the case of point cluster or uh, on lines in the case of fractal clustering, but for most of it, we have that uh, particles have some uh, kind of concentration. So indeed, we believe that uh, the main role of uh, turbulence in Keplerian disks is to help the concentration of particles. Uh, but also in this case, I would like to um, address uh, the, um, the, um, the, what I mentioned before, uh, as the effect of rotation, or better, the effect of um, varying this uh, ratio between turbulence, uh, strength of turbulence and rotation. And to do this, I focus, I decide uh, to take just one Stokes number and uh, to just uh, vary the shear rate. So vary this, um, uh, this ratio between turbulence and, uh, and the rotation. So we see that in the case of uh, smaller rotation, uh, the, the particles are uh, indeed ejected from both anticyclones and cyclones, and they cluster fractally on the slicing between the two. For faster rotation, particles start to uh, cluster, to focus inside the anticyclone, as I said before, uh, thanks to the Coriolis force. And then finally, they, they cluster, uh, they form just a point cluster in the case of most rapid rotation that is localized inside an anticyclone, that, as I said, are the only surviving uh, uh, eddies in the in the in the shared uh, in the Keplerian rotation. So uh, it's very important that uh, particles can actually um, cluster inside these long uh, living structures. Um, this I think it's very interesting because uh, this effect, the first effect, the one for lower rotation, is sometimes referred uh, in the um, in the literature as uh, turbine clustering. And a lot of time you can read the papers in which you believe that you can understand, you think that these effects are different effects, the turbulent clustering, so the clustering of lines or the clustering inside an anticyclones are seen as different mechanisms. But what we are showing here is that actually they are all the same mechanism. What is changing is just this ratio between the turbulence and the, and the rotation. Um, we also want to have a bit more quantitative understanding of uh, where particles cluster. We can see from movies that they cluster inside anticyclones, um, but uh, we decided still to, to uh, perform a more quantitative study. So we, cal we compute the vorticity at the particle position. And uh, you can see that for the low um, rotation, for zero rotation, the this uh, mean vorticity is 
always zero. For faster rotation, it starts to become uh, a lot more negative. Um, and this means that the particles are spending most of their time inside anticyclonic uh, zones of the disk. But I again want to highlight a technical issue that we have. You can see here that we are arriving to a maximum sigma in our study of 5.7. Well, before I showed you that we performed simulation up to 22, more than 22 for sigma. So why we could not go uh, higher in the study uh, to higher sigmas? This is because uh, um, when we go to higher sigma, we start to enter in the zone of uh, strong clustering, of formation of point clusters. As I said, these clusters are not only in uh, the physical space, but they are um, they go to a point in the phase space. So it means that these particles, when they go to point clusters, they act as just one particle. So the, um, the means, the averages on particles, they become completely meaningless. Um, so it means that in these cases, we lack a lot of statistics. Um, and we cannot, and the, the, the averages become very, very noisy. Uh, so the, the only way to perform this, uh, to understand uh, if particles focus inside anticyclonic vortices is to increase our statistics. To do this, we performed a lot of um, um, averages on a lot of different realization of the same simulation we performed more than 20 simulations of the same uh, with the same parameter of sigma and uh, and stokes uh, number and here you can see the result and <laughs> it's, it's uh, this pdf the still it's quite noisy but at least we can uh, we can say see some say something um and then you can as you can see uh, in black uh, we have the the vorticity pdf the pdf for vorticity for gas and we already saw that for low rotation, it's quite symmetrical. And also the PDF of uh, vorticity at particle position that is in uh, purple, it's also quite symmetrical. For faster rotation, uh, we already saw that the PDF become more skewed toward um, uh, negative uh, vorticity. But uh, in particular, we clearly see that the PDF of uh, vorticity at particle position uh, it's uh, very, very uh, concentrated at low, uh, at negative vorticity. So it indeed that these uh, clusters, these strong clusters that are formed, are uh, spending most of their time uh, inside the anticyclones. Uh, then we also want to study the a bit better these uh, two cases of clustering, so fractal clustering and uh, strong clustering. Uh, to do this, we study their mass distribution. Uh, here, for the case of fractal clustering, I computed the fractal dimension for different orders of uh, fractal dimension. Um, the fractal dimension is uh, just uh, just gives um, information on, on the strength of concentration between different sets, sets of particles. So, for the second order fractal dimension is the um, strength of concentration between couples of particles, third order between three particles, and so on. So for larger orders, we are studying larger sets uh, of particles. Um, and uh, if this fractal dimension is smaller than two, I remember you that we are in 2D, so if it's smaller than two, it means that all the particles are, the, the particles are concentrated more strongly than they would do if they were just simply uniformly distributed. And we see that indeed that this fractal dimension is uh, smaller than two for uh, almost all of them. In the case of uh, only case I'm showing here of strong clustering, uh, this dimension is equal to zero for all the cases. So the concentration is indeed very, very strong. Uh, in the other cases, we can see a multifractal distribution uh, with the fractal dimension becoming smaller and smaller for larger uh, order, um, eventually tending to, a, to an asymptote. This means, that the larger sets of particles will interact very strongly. And we believe that this is very interesting in the context of, uh, of planetism formation because these, uh, these uh, very concentrated large sets of particles might um, uh, evolve under self gravity uh, and collapse to form a planetesimal. 
uh, in the case, instead of strong clustering, we decided to study the, the time evolution of uh, clusters. And we can see that clusters, um, they form quite rapidly uh, after just a few, sec well, few seconds. We, we have uh, the clusters that are already formed. They form separately and then they merge with time to obtain at the end of the simulation just one, uh, one cluster, cluster uh, as I said, localized inside an anticyclone. Um, and uh, again, we believe that in particular, these very strong uh, uh, class, mm, cases of very strong clustering uh, in which we have just a point in which all the particles are concentrating are for, we, 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 we believe that um, might, they may uh, quite easily then collapse to form uh, planetesimals. So to conclude, um, today I showed you um, some results on uh, uh, properties of turbulent gas in capillary rotation. We saw how uh, these, uh, these two affect the turbulence and the capillary rotation can, uh, um, can relate to each other and can give uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, shapes of, uh, of eddies. Uh, we also studied the concentration of uh, particles. Uh, we saw that the particles can concentrate in most of the cases of our parameter space, uh, uh, both uh, fractally or strongly. And then these dust clumps that uh, are formed, we believe they can uh, then collapse to form uh, planetesimals. So uh, we believe these are promising results for the formation of planetesimals. If you're interested uh, we, and want to see also more results, we have a paper that is, has just been published. And uh, the future perfect perspective to which I started to work uh, lately is uh, to add the drift and back, back reaction. So to increase the complexity of uh, physics in our simulations. We also would like to find a way to simply understand uh, this, the self-interaction between different solid particles that right now they don't interact, but we would like to understand um, the, their collision or also to add the gravity to see if uh, these um, um, clumps can indeed uh, collapse. And then we are right now move, moving from 2D to 3D to, to have uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, geometrical, um, um, to see if these geometrical difference, if uh, having a more realistic uh, disk can change uh, our results. So thank you, <laughs> and uh, I will be happy to discuss with you.